Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the gathering place here in beautiful Simi Valley, California. It's quite beautiful today. And um, we're so glad that you could join us on the broadcast. And those of you that are here, well, we're grateful that you're here. And um, we're grateful to have our dear brother, Barry Linhart, with us. And, you know, amen. amen. Or I'll give, him a, I'll give him a better introduction than that, but I do want to say, I do want to say, because I forgot this completely, Bear, I want to say hello to Sean and the girls. Um, we love you guys. Miss seeing you down here, and uh, I know there'll be a time either I'll, I'll be there or you'll be here, and we'll get to connect again in a, you know, I, I know, Sean, sometimes we connect on the video, but it's better in person. Anyways, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> before we take the offering this morning, uh, we're going to have two offerings today because I'd, I'd like to give a specific offering to Barry. I mean, he works so hard and he preaches. I'm telling you, you can listen to the top ten guys out there and they're not even close. I'll be honest. If you were here Thursday night, I don't have to tell you that. You already know. If you weren't here Thursday night, <clears throat> you were having coffee with the devil. <laughs> I'm kidding. It was just sweet tea. Anyway... <laughs> Anyways, uh, you're going to enjoy it so much this morning, and I know that if you were here Thursday, you did. So in March, I have to be away for a couple of days because I'm, I'm uh, flying out to pick David up. We're going to drive back. Uh, so I asked Barry if he would come and fill in for me, and he said he would. And so that's going to be March 7th through the 9th. And, um, you know, this church has a spirit of revelation. It's a hard pulpit to fill, but this guy has it in spades. And so I think you're going to really enjoy it. And um, I believe he's going to be able to build on everything he builds on today and from Thursday. If you weren't here yesterday morning for prayer, oh my God, we just worship for a couple of hours. And when, when we were done, you just open your eyes. And when we stop, I should say, the glory of the Lord was so heavy. I remember just kind of looking over to my right and I looked at Jennifer's face and it was just a glowing with the glory of the Lord. So um, <clears throat> that's also going to be something we'll be doing. All right, let me just kind of go over some of the things that we, we have gone over the last few weeks. And I'm going to hit you with a really, I think, an interesting thought. Because everything, when we take our tithes and offerings and we pray, the things that we've been praying have been manifesting. Uh, so we're going to go co cover that just a hair. But these are the promises, and I don't want to read each one of them. I just <clears throat> so I'm going to just kind of scroll through them. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. Do you know that um, the days of Jesus, if you weren't rich, they didn't believe you were righteous. That's why Peter was shocked when he said it's hard, harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. They were shocked. They said, who, who, if the rich man can't be saved, who can be saved? Because you understand that, that riches are from the Lord. Amen. Yes. Now, there are wicked riches, we know that, but that's how the people of Israel thought when Jesus made that statement. And it says here that the Holy Ghost, or that God, teaches you to profit. He doesn't teach you to be broke. Now, you may be broke, you may get broke, you might have, you might have a Joseph moment, you know, when you go into slavery. I will say this about prophecies. Whenever you get a prophecy, don't try to make it come to pass. Amen. If the Lord says He's going to do something, you believe that it's going to come to pass, believe, believe the word, but it may not happen like you think. Amen. You know, Bob Jones had a visitation. He was a great prophet from an angel, and he ran so hard from it, he became an alcoholic to just keep the anointing away from him until he finally gave into it. Philippians, this is the one that you all know. 3 John, which I always find amazing, above all things, he prayed that we'd prosper and be in health. Well, pretty much in the United States, what are the things that run the polls? You know, health care. And um, of course, the, the health care is God and, and finances. Why is everybody coming to America? Are they coming here because we're the poorest nation in the world? No, no. no because there's great finance here. Amen. Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, you'll lead to good of the land. Matthew 6, 
I thought Barry really hit on that so good the other night. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Of course, you want to double down on the righteousness. And um, I'm going to share something about that in a second. Deuteronomy, remember the Lord. He's telling them as they come into the land and God gives them houses. He says, remember the Lord because he gives you power to get wealth. Well, God doesn't, he doesn't give you the power to get broke, does he? You could be broke. You could be a believer and be broke all the days of your life. But that's a choice <clears throat> that you make. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a monk. <laughs> you mean you like to use monk fruit in your tea? No, I'm going to be a monk. Oh. <laughs> and I'm not going to get married. Seems to me in Timothy that's a doctrine of the devil. No, no, it's spiritual, Bob. Okay, whatever you say. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Not even I shall not need. And then Psalm, which we touched on the other night, trust in the Lord, delight, commit. And then I realized that I didn't pass on the next scripture to this. And it's Psalm 68, 19. So we're going to look it up. Because I know you won't look it up. I mean, I like this much better than the old days. You celebrate, okay, everybody turn your Bibles to. So verse 19, he says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. What does that mean, Bob? That means that every day God looks at your life and he wants to, he's looking for a way to benefit you. He's looking for a way to do something good for you. He just needs your permission, your declaration. All right, it's very popular. So let's talk about this for just a second. So if you've noticed over the last several months, the things that we have been declaring when it says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, whatever we've been declaring, it's been happening. We've been watching it happen in our country and in our state. With the gas prices and, <clears throat> and with um, inflation. Bob, maybe there are 10,000 other churches doing it. There might be. I hope there are. I don't know, though, but I know we're doing it. Yeah, and I know that after we do it, it seems to be that it's happening. Yeah, right. But we're not a lot of people. <laughs> well, would you rather have one Moses pray for you yeah. or three million Israelites? I told you years ago, I had a, a, a pastor at a church when I was in Northridge. It's like a church of 3,000. Called me up because the secretary came to church and I cast a demon out of her. She got delivered and, and she got healed. Amen. And he was calling up to see if he could get some healing. Mm-hmm. When you're praying in the spirit a lot, you have something other people don't have. Right. The glory of God and the anointing of God. And there are healings that only come when the glory of God comes. And that's why we're pressing in always. And I thought, I thought Barry hit on it, the, the best I've ever heard it on Thursday, about coming up to that place of glory. It was just beautiful. Please, please listen to that. I, I mean, I know you can listen to a lot of things during the week. Please listen to that. So anyways, I'm telling you why I believe that this is so. In Malachi 3, Malachi's under the law. I know. But remember, he's straightening out the priesthood because the priests were backslidden and they were receiving the offering in a wrong way. And he said, I'm going to send my messenger. He's going to cleanse the priests and then they're going to bring an offering in righteousness. People just don't get that tithes and offering are completely connected to God's righteousness. That a lot of people tithe all their life and they don't, know, they don't ever connect it to the righteousness of God. Therefore, they never get anything from it. So we have to go back to the first tithe. And I'm not talking about the tree in the garden because I do believe that was the first tithe that God said, don't eat of that. In other words, that's mine. But when Melchizedek met Abraham, that's the first place that actually uses the word tithe. But it was not under the law. It was in the time of promise. God had been speaking to Abraham several times, but he just couldn't believe. He believed, but he just couldn't get over the hump. And so he meets Melchizedek, he gives him tithe of all. 
Who was Melchizedek? Well, according to Hebrews chapter 7, he didn't have a mother or father, no beginning, no ending, like unto the Son of God. Not the Son of God, like unto him. But it said he was the king of righteousness and he was the king of peace. But he was also the priest of the Most High God. So he was the highest priest in heaven. Now, Ian calls him the chief chancellor of the treasure rooms of heaven. I don't see it in the scripture, Bob. I know. But there's a lot you don't see in the scripture. (laughs) Because there's a lot that can't be said in the scripture. I mean, there's a lot that wasn't said. Remember what Jesus said to his men? I have things I want to say to you, but you can't hear them. And by the way, there was a lot of scripture in the scripture before 400 AD in the council of of, uh, Nicene. When they took so many things out. Took the book of Enoch out. One of them. Jesus quoted from that book. Anyways, I don't want to get into that. So, he ties to Melchizedek, who is the king of righteousness. In Genesis 15, God appears to him, and it said he believed in the Lord. And I don't want to go into that whole story of going into time and everything, but if you don't know it, you can ask me later, you can ask some of the people here. Everybody knows it. So it said for the first time, it says, he believed in the Lord and he counted to him for righteousness. There's something about when you give into God's righteousness that it, re- it allows God's righteousness to come back into you Amen. and into your nation. So God can release righteousness into your nation because of you, because you carry it as sons of God. And your dominion as sons of God has greater the dominion than the sons of darkness. Amen. Jesus called the scribes of the Pharisees children of the devil. But who was affecting the works of God? Well, they, they weren't doing anything. He was. Well, they killed him, Bob. No, he gave his life up. So under the law, you have Malachi, which is under the law. Then you have Abraham, who is under the promise. But still in Malachi, he said, the priests have to bring an offering in righteousness. Now, we're not under the law, but because we are under the promise, everything that was promised in Malachi, God said, you can prove me by doing this. I will open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing there's not room enough to receive. That means prosperity. Because they weren't by the Nile where everything was getting watered, but they were in hills and valleys. And so pouring out a blessing in the Bible always means rain. So he said, I'm going to give you the rain that's going to water everything you have. And he said, your storehouses won't be able to hold everything that comes in through the harvest. And that's how they prospered then. We prosper a little bit differently now. So God will meet you in that way. He will open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing. And then he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Well, the devourer was, you know, bugs and all kinds of stuff like that. But what has been our devourer? Unholy taxes? Unholy laws? When I think of California, we pay, well, we pay the highest gas anywhere. Why? Because we have the highest taxes. You know, a reporter was trying to get the governor to say, why is it so much more here than anywhere? And he kept skirting the issue. Because it's like we pay, there's combined taxes around $1.50 a gallon. You know, the gas itself shouldn't even cost that much. So, what it, so when you're rebuking, when you're saying... God, you're rebuking the devourer. And we say, we thank you for rebuking the high gas prices. Well, they've started coming down from that time, and we're producing more oil from that time than we've ever produced. The inflation's come down. It's starting to come down. They're talking about lowering interest rates again. I don't know if you remember this, but several weeks ago, we said rebuke the crime. Amen. And then you have the incident, which was on the news where the governor is literally, the confrontation was accidental, but somebody was walking out of the store with $380 worth of merchandise, and he said to the cashier, aren't you going to stop them? And he said, no, it's, it's the policy of the governor. <laughs> and he's the governor. He's like, that's not my policy. Said, that's not my policy. Yeah, and he got mad, and he asked for the manager and everything. She said, can I take a picture? And he's like, give me the manager. He was truly upset. He didn't realize that his policies had opened the door for criminal activity in the state of California. And I don't want to say him specifically, but 
But really, the well, let's just face it, the Democratic Party, because they're in control in Sacramento. And those are the policies that you could just go in and take up to $900 worth of stuff, walk out, and nobody's, nobody can even talk to you anymore. So that's why all these stores up by San Francisco are all closing down. They're leaving. San Francisco is kind of a shell of what it was. I'm believing God is going to come back, though. Amen. I'm trusting God that it's going to come back. So that was a wake-up call. Then the governor decided he's going to send 150 highway patrol into Oakland to help police the city of Oakland, which is a crime zone, so a war zone. Yeah. <sighs> what does that mean? You have been rebuking the devourer, and you're seeing the fruits of it right in front of your face. Amen. Yes. What's the last thing we started to do? We're rebuking the foul school systems. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Hey, Amen, Bob. <laughs> All right. So let's get your... Now remember, we're taking a second offering. We're going to take it for Barry. So this one is for the church or for Soaring Ministries. So if you're making out a check, you know how to do it. Gathering, mini- gathering or Soaring Ministries. And we have the text up on there where you can text it in. And I know you guys are ready. Yes. And you know, let's, let's do this this morning. I, I want you to stand up when we pray. All right. It's not going to bother the cameras too much. Pray this with me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. For the blood of Jesus. For the blood of Jesus. That cleanses me. That cleanses me. From all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. Poverty is an unrighteousness. Poverty is an unrighteousness. Sickness is an unrighteousness. Sickness is an unrighteousness. Your blood cleanses me from that. Your blood cleanses me from that. And Jesus, I bring my tithes and offerings to you. And Jesus, I bring my tithes and offerings to you. And present them to you as my high priest. And I ask you to present them unto our Father as an offering in righteousness. Make it a sweet savor before Him. And we humble ourselves right now. And we prove you in this way. We thank you and receive the opening of the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive. And I thank you, Father, and I thank you, Father for, rebuking for rebuking criminal activity, criminal activity all, through the state of California. all through the state of California. I thank you for rebuking, thank you for rebuking unrighteousness, unrighteousness in our school system, our school system driving, it out. driving it out. We thank you for rebuking the high gas prices in the state of California. We thank you for rebuking Inflation, Inflation. All, across our nation. all across our nation. We receive it done. We receive it done. Amen. 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 All right. You may go ahead and be seated, and ushers, you can receive the offering. And while they're doing that, uh, make another announcement. In May, I don't remember the exact dates, but I think it's on the website. In May, Ian Clayton is going to be here. And uh, it's one, one, yeah, but I just want to take, I want to say this before you buy tickets, that he's going to challenge a lot of your belief systems. And everybody has belief systems. And um, somebody said this to me last week. Uh, they used to come here and they hadn't been here in a while. And they're, they're, they said, Bob, when I was coming here, most of what you were saying was going over my head. I didn't realize at the time. Well, it's because it's a place of revelation. Uh, so, you know, not everybody is up, up to certain levels of revelation. It's over their head. <clears throat> Ian is over, you know, he's over the head of people that it's over the head of, and everything else over the head of. I'm just telling you right now, if you have false belief systems, and people have belief systems, you know, when Jesus said, you know, there are doc- or, or Paul said there are doctrines of the devil, like forbidding to marry. Well, their belief said there's a whole church based on that. That means that in their doctrine, their church belief is a doctrine of the devil. Right. So you, if you say to them, that's a doctrine of the devil, well, no, all of our priests are under that doctrine. They're the ones that run our church. You're, they're not going to listen. It's a belief system. 
So we have certain belief systems that don't allow us to walk into the depths of the glory of the Lord. Someone like Ian comes and you first hear him, you're just going, no, 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 no. <clears throat> but I'm telling you, sit, go, back, go back behind stage, sit with him. You can ask every question. He'll answer every one of them. He's got scripture for it. Amen. Or scripture that relates to it. But what, what happens then? Bob, what, what if I can't hear it? Well, when you're listening to Revelation, what it does is it literally goes in and it hits, it hits the water and the frequency within you. Like there's a lot of people right now, if you say, if you say, do you know anything about the seven spirits of God? Oh, the sevenfold spirit of God. Could you quote me the scripture on the sevenfold? I'd like to see it. Oh, no. Because it seems to me that it said seven spirits before his throne, not sevenfold. And why does it talk about wisdom as an individual spirit and understand it as an individual spirit? But if you have a belief system that there can't be seven spirits, that wisdom can't be a spirit, then you're unaware of the spirit in the ninth chapter of Proverbs, which the translators of the King James said a foolish woman, but in the Passion Translation it says the spirit of folly. And what's that? That's the opposing spirit to wisdom. It's like a woman. So it's, it's also a female spirit, but it's folly, and it tries to seduce. In the same way that wisdom lifts you, this spirit tries to seduce, but it's a spirit. But most people don't have the frequency and the water inside of them changed, so they can't hear it. They just goes. <laughs> So I'm just telling you, before you buy your tickets, understand you're going to be challenged and you're going, to, you're going to be confused. But if you're able to sit in there and listen, you're going to be transformed. Amen. So now they're already, we haven't even put it up yet, there are already 40 tickets sold. So it's not going to last long and it's, it's coming up in May. So I'm just, I'm giving you, I'm forewarning you because I don't want people to get beat up. Now, <laughs> I forewarn you today. Barry's going to say some things. He's a little more clear than Ian <laughs> about that. There was a little more clarity. But he's going to say things, and some of it is going to maybe challenge some of our doctrines. Amen. But listen, why were the children of Israel unable to move into the promised land? Because they'd lived their whole life in slavery. And so they had a slave mentality. And they said, we'd rather go back and be slaves or go in the desert. Right. And that's why God has to do new things. He has to, bring, he has to do new things in a whole different generation. That's why one of the things of overcoming death, you can't preach that in, in 90% of the churches in, in America. Why? Because they can't hear it. But the Joshua and Caleb's can hear it. I believe that you are the Joshua and Caleb's. Amen. So, listen, this man of God, dedicated to God, I know the way he prays and, and seeks the Lord. He has something to bring to you today, and I'm excited to hear it. So, a dear friend, and we go way back, years back, and um, just the hunger, and I just believe the hunger of, of the Lord that was in him, that created the connection. And we just have been connected ever since. And is it just a dear friend, his family are just wonderful people. So let's welcome our, our friend, Barry Denhart. Thank you, Bob. This on? Yeah, this is on. How are you guys doing? I'm always paying attention to what Bob is saying because he said some key words that kind of is going to steer this a little bit. And um, but how many know? I want to kind of bring some. Um, if I can just say an awareness to what I spoke in on Thursday about ascending, ascending into the upper room as Elisha took the, um, the the liberty to steward the high place. Um, just for those, how many were not here on Thursday? Okay, we prayed for you guys. <laughs> Beautiful. I want 7,000 likes on it in order to get me back. Anyway. Um, 
I'm going to bring this out because I felt it in the atmosphere. And this is an unusual sphere here. This is not a common sphere. You can go to a lot of churches and I would say it's common. They have a, it's programmed, there's a system, you, you go in, you go out. This is different here um, because there's such a, a activity in stewarding the atmosphere. And, um, you know, there's people that say, well, don't pray in the spirit. I don't know. You know what? I remember Lance saying something. This will, this will make you laugh. It made me laugh. He goes, you know, he was, um, he was in uh, Trump, Trump Tower, I think is where he was. You may be familiar with this story. Anyway, he was up there with a bunch of pastors. And he goes, man, I was feeling like, I'm going to give you the short version. He goes, I felt like I was the odd man out, man. What am I doing here in a political arena with all these guys and just, you know, I feel like I'm a fish out of water. And I'll, anyway, and then, he's, and then the Lord told him, he says, well, because you prayed for it. He goes, no, I didn't. I didn't pray. And he goes, and every time you prayed in the spirit, you were asking to bring influence to the government. Amen. There's a lot to be said in that. And I'm going to get into some things today that will help you align yourself with the reality of what God's trying to do and perhaps be vulnerable in such a way that I can open some things up so the reality of what you're supposed to be doing comes to you in this sphere. Amen. And um, I'm going to go back to Elijah and Elisha. You know, in the case, I just want to pull it together a little bit because I felt in this atmosphere, you're going to see a time in this house because hear me on this, this is a key. When you hear the scripture, the fruit of the spirit, and this is the fruits of the spirit, right? Okay. Fruit is an agricultural term. It means that time is involved. It has to grow. Okay. And so you have this element that you, you massage to become the fullness of what the intent of the seed is. And when you understand that, now, when you get to the fruit of it, the fullness of it, time then goes away. It's going to hurt your head a little bit. Because the seed that of Christ doesn't have time in it. There's no clock in him. Say that again, Jerry, because that is so deep. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I feel free to do it because there's a capacity to hear it. The reason Jesus could move in the now of who he was, because he was the fullness of what he was to be. Amen. You follow that? Yeah. Okay. So when he says, stretch forth your hand, there was not a time of delay. Take up your mat and walk. See, there's no time there. Okay. The fullness of the fruit of the Spirit requires time to grow to that reality. You do not beat yourself up because it didn't happen the first time you asked for it. Okay? Because God, we've been so, in, at least I was, I'm not going to say we, I'm going to speak for myself. We have been taught to have faith, and if it doesn't work, you blame yourself for not having enough faith to see it done. Have you ever considered that God's trying to work the character of faith into you? Because it's, God is not trying to sidetrack you and make you say, well, see, I told you you didn't have it. No, he's not doing that. There's things that happen in delay. We call delay, and God calls it character. It's character building. And so as you develop in the fruit of the Spirit, you're gonna, it takes time because we're moving from an enslaved mind and into a, a, a mind that's totally unlimited. How do you train somebody that's been in a limitation, they're born with it? Please hear me on this. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't choose to be born into the sin. You became the consequence of somebody else's choice that you were born into sin, okay? So think about it from God's perspective a little bit. What's it going to take to move them from this sin consciousness into righteousness? How, how's he going to do that? So if you look at the children of Israel, and they've been enslaved for four and some odd years, you know what he does? He throws a metaphor out there. I'm going to take you to the land of milk and honey. So you've got to shift your focus because where your focus is is where your feelings are. You follow that? And so there's this reality, and I'm going to get back to Elisha here in just a minute, but there's this reality of God shifting. There's this shift coming to this house. If you, I'm, going to, I'm going to toot my own horn because Bob did it, and I'm going to do it again. <laughs> but you've got to go back and listen to Thursday. And the shift between Elijah and Elisha on the raising of the boy. The quick, the quick synopsis is that the woman, that, uh, the woman's son that perished under Elijah, Elijah had to go get the boy, had to go take him up to his bed, had to put him on his own bed. He had to put himself on top of the child. He raises the boy. He comes out of the high place, takes the boy back to mom. Elisha doesn't do that. The mother takes the boy, ascends. Listen to the words, ascends to the upper room lays him there. 
I'm going to shorten it down just a little bit, calls for the stewardship, the person that's stewarding that atmosphere, which was Elisha, to come. He goes and he stewards that atmosphere, and then he says, you call her up here. This is not a season now where you try to call down to meet, call, call God down to meet you where you're at. It's your season to take your position as you were always intended to be, is be seated in heavenly places. You, do, you cannot put things on Bob or anybody that's in leadership. This is not that season. That season's over, people. I'm just telling you, the glory of God has a different structure than the anointing of God. Now, I can, I can tell you, we can spend a whole week just breaking that down. Because the anointing requires a man or a woman. The glory doesn't. It's God directly to the people. So in the value of what we were praying, is you, if, if you keep going, see, you praise until you worship, you worship until you enter into glory. Okay? And a lot of guys, well, how do you do that? Well, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> the next move of God is in the unknown of God. It requires you to leave what is known to get into the unknown. You're dealing with an unlimited God. He's not, he's, not, he's not challenged by you, but you are challenged by him. You guys okay? Yeah. I'm just up here just kind, of, just kind of saying some stuff. What you felt and what we begin to get into, you stay in that realm. I'm telling you, God is attracted to himself. Okay, but you have to give yourself to be permission as he is, so are we. God only rests on himself. Dang, that's good, Dr. Barry. <laughs> Oof, I can feel something. It's good. I, I was, it was funny this morning. I got up and I looked out the window and there was fog. And I go, yeah, see, there's dew point, people. <laughs> there's dew point. <laughs> dew point. Anyway, I just felt like in the, in the worship, when you start doing that and you stay there, it's not, a, it's not something that we, we normally have been trained. To, okay, you stay with you stay in this atmosphere. You stay here. Listen to, listen to what he told the, 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 the people. When Jesus was ready to go, he's going, you know what? I need you to go park in a room. Okay? I want you to go park there. Well, most of us wouldn't park here. We have a hard time parking for anything over four hours. I mean, it's just like, oh, my God. That's, I, got, I got things to do. But, he, but see, he pulls 120 people together. He says, you wait. That's not an easy thing to do. You have to be committed to that. You've got to be hungry for that. And I'll, I'll say this statement again because, hear me on this. Whatever is first in your life, you are food for that thing. Whatever your first is in your life, you're, hung, you're food for that thing. You know what's so beautiful about that? I'm just going to hear remind you. I said this last time I was here. I'm going to say it again because there's a hunger here. If you have fear in your life, Fear comes and eats off of you. You become food for that thing. You follow that? Yes. You have worry in your heart, in your core. Hear, my, hear me right. The core of you has worry in it. You become food for worry. You know what's so beautiful about that? Listen to it now. Not in that part, but what I'm about to say. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Eat of me, drink of me. You know what that means? I'm first in his life because I'm food. He's given himself as food to me to eat. Do you see that? So just that statement, if there's one scripture and you turn the page and that's all there is in the Bible and it says, I'm the bread of life, man. If you eat of me, listen to the, you will never die. Do you believe that? Yes. See, that's a, that's a jump, man. That is a jump. Is that a jump? It's a jump, and I'm going to get into it a little bit, because we're going to be here until 10 tonight. Because eternity invades time, and then you, won't, you don't even know what time. In fact, if I said you have to be here until 10 tonight, and you get 20 years knocked off your life, well, some of you guys would probably be babies again, but anyway, <laughs> you would stay. And uh, I, want to, I want to be, I'm going to be bridled, if I can be, I'm going to pull hard back on because I can run, and I feel like I, I'm, I'm charged here at the moment. And I just want to navigate this correctly. And I'm just going to put again, I want to put a bow. Stay in the upper atmosphere. Yes. Stay there. Don't come here to get needs met by a man. Yes. Come here to be transformed as God is, so all needs will be met. Yes. 
the greater invitation of God is not that he can meet your needs. It's the privilege to be as he is. Do you follow that? People that preach sin are telling you you don't have the right to become who he is, and they usher death into your life. That's what, it, that's what people usually preach from the pulpit. Righteousness is so powerful, and the deeper I get into the things of God and the glory of God and all the things that are involved in that, righteousness is the foundation. If you don't get that. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to challenge you a little bit today because there's things that we do in the Christian, especially the Paris, charismatic Pentecostal group, we got some things that we usually have learned in scripture or in the culture. We have scripture, we have script, we've learned some stuff. We know how to say some stuff. Hey, sister, how you doing? Okay, Lord, I'm going man. So good to see you, brother, over here. It's all, ah, God, on this, you know, I got a word for you. And uh, we just amp it from zero to 600 in two seconds, right? You're laughing because you know it's true. That's, and so we have all this, this things that we move in. But I have discovered by observation, there are things that are enslaved in our mind because we have covered it up with a culture that's taught us scripture, but we still have script in us that doesn't match the culture that we're running with. That means that there's actually things, and I'll use um, the children of Israel. And I want to say, you know, thanks to all the teachers that I have um, in my life specifically, obviously, Dr. Bob is the one that actually believed in Sean and I. Way back when I didn't know Jack, <laughs> but uh, you know, the value of what he carries, please hear me on this, people, you have to understand the, the treasure that's in this house. You have, you have a person in this room that is actually a, 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 such a value to this, this nation. I don't think you guys, see, it gets familiarity breeds contempt. Ah, it's just Dr. Bob, he, he's got that funny voice sometimes when he talks, you know. And, <laughs> He's really good, and he's, you know, you know how he gets when he starts laughing. <laughs> you know, you, you see, you get familiar with all these mannerisms. And you can't hear him anymore because you're too close to him. Oh, okay, quiet. It was really funny for a minute, and then you said that. Because, see, what happens, and I, you've probably seen me do this illustration. If you use a scripture, and you see, pick your favorite scripture, and you go, okay, pull it close to you, okay? No, get it closer. No, no, a little closer. Okay, you get so close to it, you can't even read it anymore. And so there's a lot of people in relationships are like this when you've been designed to hear what their book is and you've got it so close you can't even read it. That's the distance you have to recognize. There's a fear that when a man or a woman of God is at the pulpit have been called to that position. They have to be called to it. Not people that say, I'm here to you know, take stuff from the people, but actually called to it. That you need to understand there's a reverence between the distance between your relationship as a friend and the holiness that God's put in them and the awe and the revelation that they're carrying. You have, to, you, have to, you have to recognize that. And um, so there's only, you know, there's only certain people that I have in my life that I have run with. And the scripture is very clear. Be careful who you run with. Amen. Run with the seasoned people. One that have season and it says run with the older men. Why does it say older men? Because they've been proven. They've been around long enough and they prove themselves in character, not only just in faith, but the character of faith. Yeah. You guys following me so far? I'm, I'm still in my intro. I haven't even done, we haven't even, I got another 20 pages yet, people. We're just, we're just getting started. So Dr. Bob has brought something, is, uh, he's actually a national treasure to this, this, this nation. Amen. You need to recognize that. I'm telling you in the days ahead, there's going to be some shaking that's going to go on. And you have to be established in righteousness because if you don't have righteousness in you, then everything is going to shake because everything stands on righteousness. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. So you have to understand, if it's in the Spirit, in the Holy Ghost, then I would, I'd, I'd really lean into places that are really leaning into the Holy Spirit. That's what I would do. I mean, just being logical. But see, if you have righteousness, peace, and joy, righteousness is position, peace, and joy is emotion. <laughs> it's really good, Dr. Bob. I know, it's really good. But see, peace and joy are emotional. Righteousness is positional. If you step out of righteousness, you can't have peace and joy. It's not going to happen. Now, peace is also a very violent weapon because the enemy can't get it. Satan doesn't know how to get it. 
So it freaks him out. He can do so much turmoil around you. You just simply be who you are. It just freaks him out. You don't have to do anything. You're in righteousness. He's, he's going, I can't break him. I can't break her. I can't do it. Do you understand that? That's why it's a national treasure to have somebody like himself. Well, he only has, a, I don't care what he has as far as people that are listening to it. Because truth doesn't change because the numbers aren't there. Whew, why am I saying this? I'm saying some stuff. I'm just telling you, there are days ahead that you will have a higher honor for who he is because of what's going to happen in this nation in order to get it back into the position again. It's like a chiropractic thing. When you go to shift something, the first thing you know, you hear this big crack and all of a sudden you get straightened out, okay? You thank the chiropractor that you're actually out of the pain, but you didn't recognize the power of what he could do to straighten you out. And that's what happens when you get into this, the word and the reality of righteousness. I've heard that before and it's so good to hear it once, but I don't need to hear it. No, you need to become it. You need to become it. And so there's things that happen to us, and I want to I step into some things that, um, you know, I listen to a lot of different people, Dr. Randy McLean, Dr. Pfizer, and um, Dr. Mark Sharona, and, and um, Dr. Lance Wall now, of course, when Kim was here, I was running with that whole, that whole mindset. But what I want, what my, my goal for you is to obtain the, the mind of God. Amen. If I can get you to the mind of God, listen to me very carefully, and I'm not belittling prayer or anything. All prayer is, is talking. You're talking to God. That's what you're doing. If you're, I'm going to pray to God. Okay, well, you're going to talk to him then, aren't you? There are certain things that when you get to a mind of God that you don't have to pray about it because you already got the mind of it. Don't, if, it's it's kind of like if you have my wife, like I said on Thursday, I have her mind. I know what she white, likes and what she doesn't like. I don't have to go, hey, honey, would you like a bouquet of flowers or not? I'm, gonna, I'm asking you. You don't have to do that. You just go get the flowers because her mind is to receive it. She knows, uh, she knows that she likes flowers, okay? There's things that you do with God that you don't have to ask him for it if you have tamed his mind on it. Is that right? I'm just, I'm just kind of leaning into this slowly. Okay. So one of the things I want to get into is some things that are um, in my heart to say, and I want to um, bring out a reality that I think is going to be something in the days ahead that we need to be checked, make sure that we're okay um, in the thinking of how God thinks and what, what's going to happen. So you guys okay with that? And if the Holy Spirit wants to come and interrupt and we do something else, we're cool. We good with that? Yes. Holy Spirit always has precedence. He's, he's, he's the one that's here that's going to order things around, so I'm, I'm going to be sensitive to that. So I want to start off, you know, the scripture that always says, you know, when Jesus, when Nick, Nick at night, call him Nick at night, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. <laughs> <laughs> Nick at night, okay. Okay, you already worn that out, Barry. Shut up. Okay, moving along. <laughs> you know, what Jesus told him was, in order for you to, uh, you have to be born again to do what? Okay, key word, see. Okay. Now, there's a couple key words that you pay attention to in Scripture. I believe, my observation and what I've seen from what the Scripture is, Genesis 3.15 is really the whole crux of the Bible. The whole Bible. Everybody's going, okay, what's, this, what's Genesis 3? What's, what's Genesis 3.15? I want to know, I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. It's when God says, you know, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. The seed of the serpent is going to bruise the heel. You guys remember that? Okay. That means the enemy has a seed. Uh, no, devil, he, he can't create anything. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, or God just told him he has a seed. He's got a seed. That means he's a creator of something. He can create something. Have I lost you? You guys okay? Okay. As you go through in the New Testament, it, it comes out what he is. He's the father of what? There you go. Okay. Now you start putting some things together. He's a liar. In order to see the kingdom, you have to be born again. So if I can close your eyes, you can't see the kingdom. Okay? 
So I want to go through scripture with you and I want to unlock some stuff with you and, and get into some realities that actually all the scriptures that you hear and heard, and if you haven't become them, they can close on you. Why am I saying that? There's going to be some change in this nation that's going to challenge you in ways that it may close a scripture on, in front of you if you're not up to the level of where God has, wants you to be. Okay? You guys okay? You want to know? Okay. Some things I learned from Dr. Mark Sharona that have got me some digging in, and I'm just going, man, this guy's got some stuff figured out, but then I started seeing what God was doing. I'm going, you're trying to tell me something. You're trying to tell the body of Christ something. And so I'm going to share that with you if you're okay with that. So there's things in faith I want to touch. And maybe since I'm going to be back in a couple of weeks for all those three that clapped that I was coming back. That, yeah, that was pretty good. That was good acting. Yeah, this time we'll, we'll do it this time for him. He's awesome. And then we sit, I come back to it, it's cricket sounds, and there's only three people sitting. Sit. That's funny. Listen, I'm going to say this too. It's good. I, I, you know that you have a company of people that are seeking God and not a man when the people are there when the man's not there. If you're coming when he's only here, you got an issue. Because you're here for him, you're not here for God. Whoa, did I say that? Sorry. It has nothing to do with Bob. It has something to do with you. Okay, well, praise the Lord. Let's lift our hands and worship, shall we? <laughs> Woo, saying some stuff. All right, let's, let's do some. Okay, I want to talk to you about some of the things that have happened uh, in scripture, so I'm going to bring it to you, and I want you to begin to understand why I'm bringing this out, because I'm trying to, under, I'm trying to get you to understand there's some stuff coming down the pipeline that's going to rattle, that's going to rattle this nation. And um, I'm, not, I'm not saying I've been following prophets. I've heard a lot of things in the prophetic, but I've learned something. As powerful as this house is, and the prophetic that has been stewarded here, I'd rather prophesy you into a clear ending of where you're supposed to be at rather than trying to free you at a moment of where you're at god always clearly ends something before he begins it hear me right on that there's a time when you come and you minister to people because they have to be taken out of where they are okay in that moment but if, if you're truly understanding the value of what god tries to do he's going to give you a clear ending of where you're supposed to be he's not going to shoot for 10 years he's going for the whole monty this is what you're designed to do. Go do this thing, and you run your life based on that. Now, hear me in that. I would rather, like, I could move with Bob. We could do prophesy over everybody. We could do that. Okay. For a moment, if it, that's good for a moment, and there's a high emotion that comes with that, and I love it. I'm the first one that jumps in to do that. But as I've matured, I've also noticed it's a more powerful thing to move into the mind of God. If I can get into his mind, I don't need a word because I've become it. Does that make sense? There's not a lot of people that understand that because desperation and need always brings a cloudiness to discernment. You lose your discernment. Need and desperation takes discernment away from you. If I can keep the people in need and I have them in desperation, your discernment's going out the window. So far, so good? So if something happens in this nation, and all of a sudden it gets really shaky, and there's some powerful things that happen, and I'm not prophesying it is, it just seems to me that there's some consequences because some people have sold some pretty stupid stuff. And so there's going to be some consequences. But there's always a people in the land of Goshen that's going, huh, well, enjoy that, guys, but we're over here under righteousness, and we're okay. So whatever you have to say, I would, I would stay in this house, people, to what's... I'd stay here. Don't be, I didn't get a word, so I'm going somewhere else. You need to sit down and just be quiet and be full <laughs> of what God wants to develop you into instead of trying to chase every wind that's out there Amen. and uh, listening to every goofy thing that, ah, we're getting ready for Jesus to come back. Well, you're not even like Jesus, so he's not coming back for something that's not less than himself. <laughs> well, that went over really well. I'm amazed at how many billions of dollars are being made in books and prediction again. Here we go again. 
You see, God won't come until God sees himself. He's not coming. And if you're preparing to leave and he says, you, you're supposed to prepare for me to, to come heaven to invade earth, why are you trying to get to where I'm trying to get from? God's trying to get from heaven to come to earth, and you're trying to get off earth to go to heaven. See, there's a, there's a, a minor shift here, and I kind of think that God's got the upper hand on this one. Does that make sense? So you find a place that's established in foundational truths, and you stay with it, because righteousness is not going to change, because if you don't believe in it and you have become the fullness of it, well, you need to stay in there until you do. All right. Oof. See the kingdom. I want to see the kingdom. You got to be born again. So if I'm the enemy, I'm going to shut you down from seeing. How am I going to do that? Can I get a little bit more personal? Because you may walk away and go, oof, I don't have any way to cover that up. Especially when you understand at the level that I understand, I can discern it. And I can hear your scripture, but that's a closed scripture. Do you know there's such things as closed scripture and open scripture? Did you know that? Would you like to know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm in the right house then. I think I came to the right place. <laughs> I'm still concerned about two weeks from now, so I got, I got to say some stuff to have you come back. <laughs> okay, thank you. I've got one coming. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go here for a minute. Okay, so... Do you remember in John chapter um, 20 about Mary's encounter with Jesus at the tomb? Okay. So let's go to, um, I'm going to go and with that, under, and just put that in your back pocket. Say, I'm putting that in my back pocket. Yes, you are. And I'm going to begin to, whew, I'm going to say this word. I'm not going to, if I can get to it, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to define it. So this company of people are resolved because this kingdom of nonsense that's out there is going to want to challenge the kingdom of righteousness. There's, there's going to be a conflict, people. I'm just telling you straight up, there's going to be a conflict. If you're a, prof- a true prophet will always confront the government. You go through scripture, a true prophet will always confront the government. We got, I just need to, you got to recognize I'm a prophet of the Lord. And they'll say, well, okay, what have you done in the government? Oh, Oh, John the Baptist, you know, there he goes. Elijah, oh, there you go. And then you just go all that. You start going through all the prophets of old. They, they confront the government. That's what they do. That's part of the office of a prophet. Yeah. Paul even did it when, now nah, we won't go there. Okay. <laughs> what I, the word I'm looking for is there's things in our hearts. Okay, listen, the culture that you and I have been growing up, and I'll just say you and I, I'll, I'll say me. You've been designed to quote scripture to cover up things that you have at the core of who you are so that you're accepted in the culture of who you are, but you can't turn anything, you can't make anything different in the culture of where you are. Because the things that are the closest to your core of who you are is the first thing that's going to come out of you. You can have fear and anxiety in chair number one and God in chair number two, and fear and anxiety is going to lead you. But you can quote scripture with God, but the, yet there's still something at your core that's got chair number one. Here's how God works. There's only one chair at your core. That's how he wants to roll, and he's it. That's it. But reality is a lot of us have had things that have happened to us that there's another chair there, and it wasn't God's fault. It has nothing to do with anything. Things come into your life without permission. This flat came in, you just go, well, that sucked. Anybody ever had that happen? Have you ever noticed that there's things that you grow in God and things still just come into your life and go, how come that's happening? What? See, circumstances don't come to oppose you more than they are to prove you. What? <laughs> there goes the question mark. You know, it's that little, it's like when somebody puts out a smoke ring with a circle of smoke. There goes a the question mark. It's, this goes through. Say that again. Circumstances are not there to oppose you. They are there to prove you. Your authority is earned in everything that you go through, not everything you avoid. So far, so good? Okay, so I'm going to say some things that are going to begin to say, um, you're going to have to ask yourself some questions because 
in order to understand what God gets out of contradictions, when he puts you in contradictions, it raises up the core of you. It raises the core of you up. It takes, it takes an emotional engagement. What are you all about, man? Let me, I mean, you've got my script down and my, my, my words are in you, but have you become it? And there's things that you begin to realize as much as you sit here and listen to this, my intent is to make you more like God, not to learn a scripture about God, but actually become a living word. Yeah. That's, that's the fullness of it. Because if you, can, if you can quote scripture, you're now at the level of the devil, because the devil can do that. <laughs> that sounds harsh, but until the scripture are open to you and you become what it is, you have no authority to move anything, because the atmosphere sees you as a closed scripture, and I'll get to that in a second here. So what is closed scripture? And what I want to say is a lot of us have come from places that what we call a word in, uh, Mark Sharona said this, he says, there's honest doubt. You actually have honest doubt. It's justifiable doubt. Think about the children of Israel. For 400 and some odd years, you're in Egypt, and all of a sudden this guy shows up and says, hey, I was out talking to this bush, and uh, it wasn't being consumed, and he says, we got to let people, you know, we got to get you out of here. You're going to go like, what? <laughs> what? You on meth? Are you, what are you doing? What, what, what are you all about? See, that's, that's a jump. That's an honest doubt. That's what I would call an honest doubt. Wait a minute now, I'm, uh, you know, that's from jumping from enslavement to freedom. Oof, that's a big jump. That's an honest doubt. And a lot of us have carried in this honest doubt, and it's actually closed the scripture. I'm going to tie this all together in a minute. It closes the scripture. Even though you know it, you've witnessed it. You've actually worked as it but something comes and closes it. Can I give you a scriptural basis? Because people are going like this. They're going, what the? <laughs> All right, let's go, to, um, let's go to Luke chapter 24. I need a, we need a sound box that has turning pages. So, you know, <laughs> I can't hear the finger swiping on the iPad and... I need to, you know, back in the day, you'd hear all the church, you'd hear all the pages turning, you go, all right, they're following me. Now you just get this blank look. You go, well, this is really powerful. Whew. Um, it's the story of the two to Emmaus, and I'm going to wrap it around to the grave, and we're getting into unwavering faith. We're going to get into some stuff. I'm going to read you something that Dr. Marina said um, on one of her shows or TV series, but I, it was a great definition of faith. I, I want to know, if God says he, he's looking for faith, faith is what pleases him. You ever heard that before? Yeah. You ever heard that? Yeah. Uh, do you want to know how you get it? Yeah. I thought you already knew. It's a, it's a very fascinating, but I'm going to read this to you. Faith is the conviction. This is Dr. Marina. She says, faith is the conviction. Faith is the conviction. It's not an attempt. It's a conviction. Faith is a conviction that can be defended until the evidence becomes visible. I'll say it again. Faith is a conviction that can be defended until the evidence becomes visible. It's a conviction. Okay. Something has to prove to you and to, in order to establish a conviction in you. Follow that? Okay. Let's go to Emmaus and let's see how far this goes. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was three score furloughs from Jerusalem. It's about seven miles. And they com communed with each other of all the things which had happened. Stop. They communed with about the things that all the things that happened. They communed about the things that had happened. What had happened? They watched Jesus get crucified. Okay. What you don't know, and when some of the scholars are saying that it comes along as this story begins to unfold, Cleopas, that's part of this, one of these people walking, that's actually Joseph's brother. That's the uncle to Jesus. Oh. Oh. Yeah, go, go check it out. Some of the scholars are saying, that's Cleopas. That's, that's Joseph's brother. He was, that's family. Jesus is walking up to family. Interesting. For what it's worth, I can't build a church on that, but it's, you're going, okay. It doesn't change what I'm trying to say, but just an interesting thing that 
people looking at that. Anyway, and they communed with each other. Say, say communed. Okay, that means a significant emotional event captured them. It caught their eyes. It caught their emotion. Now, these guys are following Jesus. They know him. As you begin to unfold this, they're going, and they communed. Oh, COVID came. Oh, COVID came. COVID, COVID's here. Okay, okay, so let's talk about it. Did you, how's your uncle doing? I know he heard it. And see, so you start communing with the tragedy. You're communing with it. And so what is it doing? It's closing the scripture on you. I thought Jesus heals all diseases. I thought he did that. Well, no, no, this is happening. This is real now. Here's the problem with that. Truth is established before fact is. And truth is the higher level, no matter what fact does. I'm trying to tell you there are things coming that you're going to be tempted to commune with. Oh, my gosh. Okay, watch this story now. Watch this story. They're communing because of a tragedy. Significant emotion. You watch somebody be crucified that you love dearly, and they die, and you watch that whole thing, and he says, you know, the whole thing about him coming back? That blanked out. High emotion closed the scripture. Why do I say that? Let's see what he has to say about it. They commune with each other on all these things which had happened. Dang it, the tragedy. This happened to me. Da, 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 da. This is this, this is that. Okay. Verse 15, and it came to pass while they communed. Okay. They're, 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 they're captured by what death can do. And questioned together that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding. Stop. Why were their eyes closed? Well, God came up and, let's see that spirit of Bob. Well, God came up and <laughs> closed their eyes so he wouldn't recognize. No, the tragedy closed their eyes. Do you remember Mary that was at the tomb? She's running around. She goes, and we'll get into it maybe, and we'll speak into it. I'll, I'll give you a quick version of it. She peers into it. Her heart is looking for him as she knew him. Again, tragedy. She watched it. Okay? Okay. Now, there's a lot there because the disciples, when they saw it, they go like this. Huh, okay, well, that's okay, whatever. <laughs> but there's a level that she's at. There's something more, and there's something in my heart that needs to complete, because I didn't get to finish the whole thing with him, the burial, and I mean, we need to, I got to figure where he's at. And Jesus stands right in front of her. Tragedy closed her eyes. So you think you, you've got the scriptures figured out? Well, you may, do, you may be, you do, but do you have your emotions figured out? Can you manage your self-awareness? Watch what happens here. Jesus himself drew near and he went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what communications are these that have with one another as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Stop. Followers of Christ said, this guy's it. Watches the crucifixion, communes with the power of what death did, rather than the promise of what resurrection's already done. The next move of God will be shut down by you communing with what this nation is doing that's not in line with God. If you pay attention to what's going on there, it's going to close the scripture on you. I got a call. I got a call. Did you know what they just did? Well, it has nothing to do with what he did. It's what is God going to do in response to that. So, they rehearsed everything and they were going into this whole thing. Anyway, um, as we get into this, let me go into this a little bit further. This thing went down a little bit. Okay came to pass let's see here how did that happen Jesus drew near and he went with him their eyes were holding should not know him he said then what communications are these that you have with one another listen to me carefully what communications are you talking about what is your common union of this that you're tying yourself with that you can't see me communion means common union You've unified over something. That's not me. That's not where I'm at. I'm not there anymore. 
I'm not there. And moves of God, usually people want to reference where they were in order to validate what hasn't been established yet. But it doesn't work that way. There's things that are going to happen in this house that's going to happen that has never happened anywhere in the world before. You know why? Because there's a company of people who wants to know something of the unknown. And you can't get to the known, next known of God until you go into the unknown of God. Okay. Now, in a minute I'll really get going here. And he questioned together that Jesus was doing with them. He says, and their eyes were withholding. We got that. What communications are these that you have with one another as you walk? Oh, pay attention. What's your walk like? Who are you walking with? What kind of conversations are you having with them? What's going on here? Do they have the mind of God or they have scriptures about the mind of God, but they haven't become the mind of God? See, that's different. Okay. So, Keep going. You walk with communion. These are have one of those you walk. And they stood still and they looked at it. And one of them named Cleopas answered and said unto him, Hey, uh, dost thou the only one sojourn in Jerusalem and you know not the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said to them, What things? Okay. We laugh at that, but see, he understands that there's things that are, that are happening here that I, you, you're going to have to do some stuff here to, to pull it out. It's... it's there's a well inside of him that it takes understanding to pull that thing out. So he's, he's going to throw some questions out there. What things? What's holding you up at the core that you're not seeing me now? That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. He's going, to, I'm going to pull some stuff out here that, you know, this is, you guys are not, you're not tracking here. So we go into this here as he says, what things? And he said unto them, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed, and the word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him, and they, they took away what I followed. And see, there it goes. <laughs> but we hope that it was. Oh, where's your hope? But we hope that it was he who would, should redeem Israel. See, they got him for as a, you know, he's going to come back and rule this as a king. That's what he's going to do. Even the disciples are on the way out, he's going... Well, you guys are slow, dude. Well, you guys are way slow. All right, keep going now. But we hope that was him they should redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, now it's the third day since these things have come to pass. Moreover, certain women to our company amazed us, having at the tomb, it was there early, and they found not his body, and they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, and he said he was alive, and... But see, we're not focused on that, man. We're focused on the crucifixion. This just sucks. <laughs> and then a certain of them that were with us that went to the tomb and they found even so as the woman had said but they, they said not listen to how Jesus responds to it listen to his words he said unto them oh foolish oh oh what'd you call me yeah based on what that an emotional event in your soul closed the scripture in your eyes to who I am now. Wow. Wow. Foolish. Wow, that's, that's, that's not a really high compliment. <laughs> and, and, slow to heart. Because the trauma has now blinded you to the promise. The scriptures are now closed. Do you see that? Don't come into this house under traumatic situations and talk about the trauma that's closing the scripture. You need to speak the scripture to contradict the trauma that has come. Listen, this is tying into you don't go to the man or the woman to break you free. You ascend to the man or the woman that's already in the upper place, in the high place. Go up the stairs where the upper room is at, where the glory is already established. You go there. Don't tell him to come down here and meet me. You go up there and meet him where he's at. That's what's going to shift in this nation. But if that's going to be the case, then it means that Satan's going to put on more trauma in order to blind you what is God is trying to establish in this nation. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So watch what he says. Slow to heart. He behooved it not the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory. And beginning from Moses and from all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Why? Because the scriptures were closed in them. 
It's over. Their trauma, wham, it shut it down. It doesn't matter how many miracles you witnessed. It doesn't matter how many people you saved. That one traumatic event, and God himself in the form of Jesus, wham, he sh it got shut down. And he says, i got to open it up again. So from Moses all the way through to establish himself once again. The trauma that this nation is going to do, because there's some yahoos, the law of sowing and reaping isn't just for us. It's for everybody. And there's some dinglings that did some crazy-ass <laughs> stuff. You know? And what's going to happen is there's going to be trauma coming out of it, because it wasn't peace they planted. It was trauma. <laughs> Why am I saying that? Every healing that's ever happened, every prophetic word, if you do not understand this, you have the potential of having the scriptures closed because then emotionally you can be shut down and soon following that, because of the trauma, the scriptures will also. You know what you'll say? Why did God allow that to happen? What's the sovereignty of God? He just does what he... I don't understand. Come, uh, come down here, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. True or not True. It's true, isn't it? All right. So you begin to go through this process, and you go, wow. Oof. So he's going, okay. He interpreted to them. See, he's, he's opening it all up again, because the, the trauma closed it. Say the trauma closed it. Trauma. See, there's, this is where honest doubt comes in, because it's justifiably, emotionally, I can say, I don't think what I heard about him raising from the dead is true because the trauma is so powerful in me, I can't see it. Do you see that? Now I'll say it a little bit further. There's still things I believe in this room and some people here have more trauma that's more powerful than them than the scripture that's in them. There's nothing wrong with that. That's called being honest. That's being real. I'd rather be vulnerable with you and get you to the place where God's at than you to hide behind these scriptures and never see God. Dr. Tina and I had a, a program for years that that's what we were doing. She's brilliant at it. We unlocked a lot of people that had gifts that were coming out, you know, their hands and doing stuff for God. But as soon as something came into their lives that was traumatic, it got shut down. Because you didn't know how to manage it. You guys enjoying this? This is just the, this is my intro. I'm going to get to unwavering faith in... Some other, the character of faith. You need to understand the character of faith. I'm going to say this in case I just don't quite get to it yet today. <laughs> God, a lot of times, when you pray for something and you don't receive it in the timeline that you're supposed to have it, like I said, he's not interested. There's, there's actually the equivalence of being delayed and built up in the character of faith. Versus I need an instantaneous, I need great faith for this moment, and I walk away, I don't have any character, but I got what I needed. Okay? God would rather have you be built in the character of faith than give you something instantaneously for a reprieve for a moment, but have a character to carry him the rest of your life. All right. We'll get there. Verse 28, And they drew near nigh into the village where they went, going, and he made them... He would be made as though he's going to go a little further. <laughs> and then they constrained him, saying, Hey, abide with us, for it's toward evening, and you know, the day is now far spent. And he went in to abide with them, and he came to pass when he had sat down with them to meet. Okay, stop right now. Okay. Whose house is Jesus going into? Hey, you should have your Bibles. Tell me, what's it say? <laughs> you guys are looking at me like, like I got six, six, heads, six eyes in my head just going, What? <laughs> Did you not just... It, it says... Listen, watch this now. I'll read it to you because nobody gave me an answer, so I'll slow it down. <laughs> and he, they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. And he went in to abide with them. Okay. So they are going, inviting him to where they are staying. Correct? Yes. You got that? Yes. Okay, where's Jesus staying? Okay. And it came, Uncle. And it came to pass, yes, Joseph's brother, that's right. And it came to pass when it had sat down with them to meet, he took the bread. Stop. Wait a minute. Stop. What just happened here? Wait a minute. If I have you come over for Christmas dinner, do I not serve you the dinner? Am I not the host? That's not what's going on here. He became the host. 
soon he, as soon as he was invited into the house, they became the guest. What's he doing? What's he doing? He's feeding them. Whatever's first in your life, you become food for them. Oh, man. Come on. Watch what he's doing. Watch what he's doing. He's going, okay. He sat down with them, and uh, here we go. Verse 30, and it came to pass when he sat down with them to meet, he took the bread and blessed them, and breaking it, he gave it to them. Because the scripture that's walking with him has opened the scripture to them. I'll say it again. The scripture that was walking with them opened the scriptures to them. Because it says he went from Moses, took it all the way through the Bible, opened it all up. That means you can now be fed again. You follow that? Do you follow that? And so now he says, I'll be guest. I am the bread of life. Let me break this and I'm going to bless it. Okay. What happens? Their eyes were opened, verse 31, and he vanished out of their sight. You know what just happened there? This next reality of who I am, I'm not leaving you. I am leaving the sight naturally, but the presence of me is with you. I'm taking you off trying to see me to prove things. Well, I won't do it unless I see him. He's going, I'm, 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 I'm out of here in your eyes, but I'm with you always. See, he's weaning him out of that. You follow that? Now, that's why it's so much more important to be in a place that has his presence so that you can be fed from him versus not having a place that has no presence. The word is being given out, but it's not feeding the people because they have closed scripture because of trauma. Drama. All the things that we bring to the house of God, God's going, I'm still in the nursery, I've got to open the scriptures and I've got to feed them. There's nothing wrong with that if that's where you're at. But this house is not that. I'm telling you, you will have a point where this house won't require you to see Bob. Bob will require you to see God. Because Bob is designed to bring the value of what God is, not for him to represent God only, but bring you up to the place of where he's at. Just like Elisha did, come to the upper room. I'm not going to come down now. I've trained you. You come up. If you want things made right, the glory, listen, like I said, God only rests on himself. He may visit a place, and he leaves because the people aren't him. That's why he's only visiting. There's been no generation ever that tells the presence of God beyond one generation. I can probably bet that drama or trauma came into that reality, and it caused God to pull back. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying it as wisdom coming before you, going, pay attention to the trauma that's coming. Don't let it take your eyes that it closes the scripture. Because what God did in this incident is that he had to bring his son, or what Jesus did in this incident. See, perception, perception is followed by observation. I'll say it again. Is this too much? No. Okay. Perception is followed by observation. What they did is they observed the crucifixion. Trauma, blood. I mean, he's beat beyond even recognition of a man. And the scripture in the Bible, if you saw a Bible, it'd just be closing like this. Inside, he's going clunk. And you stand there. Uh, I've been there. I've been there. It's not an easy place to navigate. But because I navigated through it, I have the authority to take you through it. It's just not, oh, I'm just going to tell you something. No, I've actually been through it. Been through it more than once. It's not an easy thing to, to navigate through. So what you begin to see is they were projecting on Jesus what they saw. Do you hear what I just said? They were projecting on Jesus what they saw. Can't be born again unless you see the kingdom. So if I'm going to mess you up, I'm going to change your eyesight. What do you see? 
Jeremiah. I see an almond branch. You see right. That's why you ask questions like that. What do you see? Because if the sight is messed up, the scriptures are going to close. And now you're going to yell at me from the soul and throw scriptures at me and it won't open. It won't work. You have to become it. You guys all right? Yeah. So what happens is Jesus did this and systematically, what's he do? He had to first open the scriptures in order to open the mind. I like what Bob was saying when he started. Ah, that's the same thing we're talking about. Know, Revelation so high, I cannot understand. <laughs> okay. There are things in God that you cannot bring a practicality to because it takes an open spirit to receive it. I don't know how many times I've been told, you need to be more practical, Barry. You're just talking way the heck out there. I mean... I can't tell you practicality because it's coming right from God. Now, God's trying to tell me something at a higher place, and I'm not going to dumb myself down to make you feel like, oh, you need to come along, and I'm going to train you how to get there. It's either you're open or you're close to it, and if you're hungry for it, you will become it. That's just, it's that simple. Now, I understand nursery and children, babies, diapers, I get that. But if you've been sitting in a house for 20, 30 years and just sitting there, and you're asking, tell tell me practically, the spirit realm looks at you and says, they're still in diapers. That's just a baby sitting there. Okay, open the scriptures. It opened their mind. It had to do then what? It happens to open up their heart. It has to open up their will. It has to open what? Their eyes. Because this is what happens. He says, as you go and you read on a little bit further, then it says, they they said, scripture, I'm going to get right here in my notes. Yeah, it's really good. Super good. And so when he broke the bread and he blessed it, and then he vanished. He did what? He disappeared. So, what happened? It says this. He vanished in verse 31, for 32, and they said one to another, was not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way, while he opened the, to, uh, the scriptures to us? And they rose up in that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Okay, stop. That's a seven-mile run, man. These guys got right up and said, all right, I'm on fire again. i got to go tell somebody something. I'm going to go tell them. So what's he do? They go back, and they found the 11 together, and, and uh, them that sat with them, so there's more than the 11, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they rehearsed the things, that it happened in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of the bread. And as they spoke these things, he himself stood. The first time he came, he came in between them. The second time he come, is he's coming from them. Do you see that? Do you see that? See, so he had to open it up. It's not that Jesus never did want to come. He came both times, but one time he, they were closed. And once the scripture was open, he's coming from them. It's from what he, they're saying. Now he comes. The first time he came, it, it was closed. And he goes, man, I gotta, these guys are blind as a bat, man. These guys don't know what the heck they're talking about. And he, and he had enough heart to say, I, I need to save these guys. Because the trauma of what happened is more powerful than what they've known in their heart in the scripture. So they haven't become the scripture. They may have it in their heart, but they haven't become the fullness of it. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay, now that was my intro. Because, what time is it? Oh, it's time to sit here and listen to some more, huh? I want to get into something called um, the character of faith, which um, was, I, I hung out with uh, Dr. Rennie and uh, the glory and some of the things that I want to continue to, to cultivate here. And there's some things that I've learned from him in the glory realm and in the faith realm. There's, there's things that I've learned from different people, but I want to bring something to you because why I said what I said just now is this. The roots, listen to me very carefully. You're probably going, I'm not going to try to write this down because I'll just go back and listen to it. Well, good. You're going to have to listen to this a couple times. The very core, the roots of your core will determine, will de- will determine the views from your soul. I'll say it again. This is being practical for you that want to know what practicality is. Check your, check your soul. 
The roots of your core will determine the views from your soul. You can only live from the view that is being released from your core. So if there's high trauma, guess what you run everything through? You run everything through that trauma. You run everything through that. Does that make sense? So what you've got to realize is, okay, I need to, number one, identify that, because I'm going to be really honest. I'm going to be real, real with God and say, there's, I have an issue here. I have an honest doubt on certain areas. And that's okay. God doesn't go white-knuckled on the throne going, oh, my gosh, or oh, myself. I don't know what I'm going to do here. <laughs> it's like, it's not, it's not something that's hidden from him. He can see it. The problem is, is that you can't. It closes your eyes, and you can't see him. So you have to be honest. Good intro? Okay, so here's what happens. Let's start getting into it. A scriptures that are a knowledge of scripture with an untransformed mind. Hear me right now. I'm trying to tell you something because there's traumas coming, people. I'm just telling you. You don't have to be a prophet. You can just tell what people have planted. You can tell what the government planted. They planted some stupid stuff. So there's going to be stupid things that are going to happen. And there are stupid things. It's going to get a little worse before it gets a little bit better. Because it's going to take the prophetic office and the, the spirit of the apostolic to put this thing in check. So I, I'm, I'm going to say it strong here because I'm going to set you set, make you set yourself, okay, is that my soul or is that my spirit? Why am I responding this way? Listen, Jesus had to do the same thing. Otherwise, there is no way you can go in the Garden of Gethsemane and go through that frantic thing that he went through to the point that his forehead broke open and blood's coming out of it. That was not an easy thing for Jesus to do. That's his soul. Oh, Jesus. Uh, that is not the time to go, cast all your cares upon him. He cares for you. Listen to me carefully now. We have sometimes taken the kingdom gospel and we reduce it down to make it really simple to try to fit in your realm. And there's things that happen in your life that it's not a simple thing to get out of. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. You don't start quoting scriptures, you know, uh, you know, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Uh, you start putting all the scriptures out there it's trying to bring peace. I speak peace unto you. This is not a peace issue. This is not something that, you know, casting your cares upon him. He's wrestling out the power of what he has done. He actually really liked resurrecting people. He liked going around healing people. He liked going around and casting demons. He really liked that. He really did. Then it's time for the cross. Then what happens? Ooh, that's a high trauma event. Oh, oof. Uh-oh. Now I got my eyes and my soul are wide open here. You're asking me to do what? Okay, I'm going to play the card of, why well, know all things are you know, possible, so let's take this cup from me. I vote that. What's he doing? He's settling the issue of the trauma of the cross. Ooh, I'm saying some stuff, man. Well, I thought he could, he just could do it all the way. Yeah, there's that Bob thing again. I thought he would just go through and just go through and he'd just be fine. He, he'll be fine. Well, he wasn't so fine. He had to work that out for himself. He had to grow in knowledge and wisdom and favor and stature with man and with God. He had to work that out. He's working it out. The trauma. He's smart enough to know that the event is near him. And I'm going to work this thing out before it arrives. And I'm going to work it out in such a power that it's the joy that's set before me. I'm going to go through this thing. I'm not going to be stuck on that cross. I'm going through that cross. That's what I'm going to do. What am I saying to you? There are things that is coming in trauma. You better work it out before it arrives and get it all hammered out. And you say when it arrives, hey, I saw this coming. I'm rejoicing the fact that God gave me the wisdom to go through this thing because I understand faith, I understand trauma, I understand it all. Because I was taught that you've got to learn more faith in order to conquer everything. Well, let me help you with something. Faith is not a thing, it's a person. Faith is a person, it is Jesus Christ. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. That means I have to be with him. He's the one that's going to initiate that. I can't read a book about him and think I'm going to get faith about him. You and a lot, a lot of religious, not you, but religious people, you've got to read more Bible, otherwise you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get better results. I think I should have been a comedian. I don't know. It's not about, please hear me out. Well, people are going, he's saying you can't read the word of God? <laughs> Spirit of Bob, what's going on here? <laughs> 
Now, if I come back and some of my hair is missing and it starts... <laughs> the fullness of Bob has arrived, I'm very... Anyway, or it goes the other way. Bob comes back, he has full hair. Ah, that's... Hallelujah, let's worship God. Okay. If Jesus is the author of your faith, is it not the person of Jesus to establish it in you? Because you can read that book as a closed book and not obtain one ounce of faith. Because it's closed to you. You can recite it. You have it next to you. You can be dying inside from trauma and have the life of Jesus as a friend, but not as the absolute core of who you are. You can have a living hell inside of you and quote scripture, waiting to get into heaven secretly and silently. The silent conversations that you have with yourself is actually more true than the scriptures that you are saying that you have faith in what you're saying. That means that Jesus is the only one that can start your faith. If he's the one that starts it, it's his job to finish it. Your biggest issue is do not let trauma get in front of you what God's already put in you. You stay in a place. You come to a place where the presence of God is established because there's things that happen that Jesus he himself... Think about it, people. Think about it. Jesus comes up out of the water. The heavens open up. Spirit, my son whom I'm well pleased. What does God do with him? He takes him to the world and just saves everybody? Nope. He takes him where there is nobody. Why is he doing that? Has it ever considered to you that God is saying, I'm going to check this guy out, my son, that he's got character and everything built into him because the mission of who he is and the contradiction of where he's at is greater that's in him than the things that are outside of him. You will be put in front of things that are contradictory to the word of God to prove the value of the word that's inside of you. Because if the contradiction comes and you become, well, it was really sad it happened and all these things in trauma and I thought it was going to be this and I thought I prayed about it. And that's what we hear when you're talking. And I'm going, whoa, stop it. What did God have to say about it? What did he have to say about it? Because he's the author of your faith. Why are you traumatized by that circumstance that's in front of you? It's actually a compliment to you. Unwavering faith means you have an unwavering, unwavering commitment to Jesus. Well, I had, to, I had to do it because the government made me do it. Oh, we took money from the government to keep the church open. You're stupid. I'm going to say things that, that could get Bob in trouble, but since I'm not residing here, I'll say it. <laughs> oh my gosh. You guys okay? I'm starting to get into my message now. Because perception is, 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 is followed by observation. It's what do you observe? What do you discern? If it's trauma, if it's things that you're seeing, and I'm trying to get into the silent doubt, this silent doubt that's in us, man, that, that thing's a beast. That thing's a beast. It's a beast, people. The disciples, man, they were with Jesus. Come on now. They breathed the air that he was walking in. They did the miracles. They did that. They cast out devils. You know what they did? Silent doubt. Soon they go, party's over. We're going fishing. Okay, here we go. Because they were in this fear of somebody that was what they said, and they hadn't become it yet. They were under the umbrella of him. That's why I said, you go now. You go get anointed. Don't you come in here and think you're going to fly under my anointing. You guys okay? There's a lot of things that are happening in this moment right now because God's got enough trust in you to hear what he is saying because there's things coming down the pipeline it's going to, it's going to be the, the trust of you that's going to carry the fullness of him yay you guys okay so far I have 15 more pages I got a whole book man there's a book right here I got a whole book This is my first opening. Okay. Can I go a little further with you? Okay, let's put ourselves inside of Noah's mindset. Again, Hebrews 11. I would challenge every one of you today, go home, go read Hebrews 11, and see how faith was established with those people. Okay? 
Here's what I want you to challenge you with. Who initiated it? On every single one of them. I think I'm barren, I'm Sarah, I'm past. I, I'm going to believe God for a baby. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm going to believe I'm going to build this boat and I'm going to save my family. No, you're not. No, you're not. God's going to come down and say, hey, this is what's going to happen. Because I'm the beginning of your faith. I'm the author of it. So you're going to get to know me. That's what's going to happen. Okay? That's what's going to happen. Uh, Abraham, father of our faith. Whoa, there's one. I think I'm going to leave town. And go this way. I think I'm feeling a land of milk and honey or something out there. There's something out there. <laughs> you think that's what happened? Nope. Who came? Who's, who's the author of faith? That means it takes a visitation from God personally to you to start this faith thing. You think you can read that book without the spirit on it and think you're going to get it? You're not. You have closed scripture thinking you've got something that's open and you fooled yourself thinking you have faith because you can quote a scripture. Well, like I said, you're at Satan's level now. Good for you. It's real. I'm just being honest with you. That's real. He knows the scripture too. See, once the Spirit's on it, that book, you won't not do anything but read it because it's, it, you're being fed by it. Because whatever is first in your life is food to you. Whew, let's keep going. Okay, let's be, uh, let's be, um, let's be uh, what was I going to be? Noah. Okay. When God comes to you, because God's coming to this house, I'm telling you right now, he's coming to this house. In a unique way. It's not that he's not here already. There's another level here. Don't you know that God is always glory to glory? It's progressive. It's not going back and reviving. It's progressive. Now, you hear a lot of things, we need revival, we need reformation. Okay, I get the reformation part. I think your lingo for revival is wrong. I understand your heart, your intent, but you don't understand glory. That's why you've, you've been taught revival, we have to go back. No, I'm not going to go back. I'm going to go forward. My forefathers, their shoulders I stand on in order to get it to the next floor that needs to be established. They hit their ceiling, that means their shoulders is my floor. That's really good, Dr. Barry. If you heard that and that alone, you're good. So what happens is, is in Noah's car, uh, in his um, building of the ark, Hebrews 11, it's really, you know, by faith Noah. Listen to the scripture. Hebrews 11, verse 7. Thank you for all the pages turning. Here we go. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Uh-oh. What happened? Now faith is the evidence. Now faith is what? The substance of things, what? Oh, evidence of things not seen. Oh, evidence of things not seen. Oh, that means you have to have somebody that comes and show you some things that you are only seen in the unseen realm, right? You got that? Okay. Moved with godly fear. Oh. Oh, he did what? He moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark. For saving of his household, which he condemned the world and became heir of, oh, there's that crazy word, of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Listen, Noah had a language about a day that was coming, but a language that was not known amongst the people of that day. I'm going to say it again slower because you need to capture this because I'm trying to get a language in you that you're going to speak, that there's people in this language, that they're of, of, com of uh, trauma and all the things are happening. You're going to speak differently. You're going to be different. Yeah. Noah had a language. He had a language about a day that was coming. He knew the day was coming. John the Baptist says, there is one amongst you. You don't know. He is here, but you don't know him. There's an unseen realm that's in this atmosphere right now. There's something is coming. It's coming. You don't know who he is, but when he comes, he's coming in a way that you've never seen him before. There's evidence that's been brought forth in the language of what's being crafted at this moment. God is making you aware of a language of a day that is coming. I am telling you, it's like Jesus saying, they're gonna, I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to pick it up, but they're going to crucify me. I'm trying to give you a language to make you understand there is a day coming. Now, you may not understand that at the moment, but I'm telling you there's a day that is coming so that when the day is coming, you maintain the integrity of the language and of the promise that I said I would come back. Not you to be traumatized by what is happening to me and you close the scripture on the thing that I told you that the very thing that was going to happen. 
This is going to be a house called glory. It's not going to be called the gathering place only. It's going to be called the place of glory. Why? Because I'm telling you, there is a day that is coming, and the language amongst the people is, I'm, I have full right all have sinned and fell short of the glory. This is not a place where you come in here to dump all your problems and have a need met for a moment. It is to return to the original design of what God intended this to be. And God will not come back for his people until they're in the glory of who he is. There's nothing that God's coming. He's not coming back for an anointed people. He says, I'm returning in my glory, not my anointing, his glory. There is a place in him right now. He is not there in heaven living from resurrection. He is living from glory. And he expects when he says, as, as, as he is, so are we in this world. I am not going to return to the power of resurrection only. I'm going to go for the full Monty on my birthright for the understanding of what the glory is and the fullness of the original intent of what God made me to be. This is not to be a help center and a place where problems are dumped and you just meet people one by one. This is a place where you say, I found and discovered the design of what God intended me to be. Therefore, I would come together under the house of the canopy of the glory of who God is. If you think you're anything less than that, then I've got something to say. Trauma may close that down because you don't understand your full birthright. And when you understand the value of your full birthright, God says, I'm 100% behind that person and I will come to that at any time they say anything because it's not them speaking it's me they gave them the right they understood the righteousness of what i gave to them they didn't just quote it they became it they became the design of the original adam when jesus said i am finished it's over it's done most people think the assignment of that is just for redemption only no he completed what the first adam couldn't he became the fullness of what adam was supposed to be he says it's over i'm the last adam i completed the original design of what adam was supposed to be it came to us as redemption but it also became a fulfillment of the design of what God intended for Adam, the original Adam to be. That's what was happening. Faith, because you have unseen evidence, gives you the ability to understand the invisible. Oh, I need to go back and listen to this. Yes, you do. <laughs> We see Jesus on the cross as redemption. That is true. But why is he calling himself the last Adam, the second man? Why is he doing that? Because he's trying to show the original design of the first Adam failed. And he walked it out as the original Adam and he says, it's finished. I completed the original design of the original Adam. You may want to consider that with redemption. You guys all right? <laughs> Those that understand this revelation are the people you're supposed to run with. Well, I go to seven places. <laughs> really? Huh. See, God vo God's voice always finalizes their reality. God's voice will always finalize your reality when you listen to him. So it's going to be a different reality when you hear. If you're hearing what I'm saying, there's a different reality that's present. It wants to manifest. It's like dew point. It's like this morning when I saw the fog, I go, see, there's dew point. If you weren't here on Thursday, you should have been. Here we pray for you. <laughs> a, quick, a quick synopsis, I'll just say it again. There's not many places, listen to me very carefully. In order for fog to form, that means there has to be water content in the atmosphere. It's unseen, but it's present. Okay. There's a lot of churches that have atmospheres. There's no moisture in it. There's nothing in it. There's no spirit in it. There's nothing there. Even if they have 40,000 people. If it's not there, it's not there. Don't waste your time on it. But when you get into a place that has, you can feel it. It's tangible. You know, it's like when you're in humidity. That's what, there's present moisture. You can't see it, but it starts forming on you. See, that's what's present in the atmosphere. Because the temperature and the pressure then begins to um, push the moisture content that's in the air out. 
that's when it becomes fog at lower, print, at lower uh, temperatures. It presents itself, it was always present, but the pressure and the temperature wasn't right for it to manifest. It jumped from the unseen onto the scene, and we call it fog. Same thing with God. He's present. The fullness of God is present. Is the prayer and the desire there in such a way that puts pressure on heaven to manifest the unseen on the scene? It's really good. It's really good. I'm telling you. Hebrews 11, 11, I'm just going to throw another one out there to be my first closing, and then we're going to have 20 more. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, there's just so much here. I'll say this before I say the rest of Hebrews here. It says... um, you will naturally please the one that owns your mind. It's a natural thing. The one that owns your mind, you will naturally please that. But I'm going to say it this way a little further. Most people possess a desire, but are afraid of giving themselves over to that desire out of fear of the uncertainty of giving themselves over. It's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing. I, I believe um, Dr. Pfizer wrote that, and when I read that, I'm going, there it is. Because when your mind and your ears are owned, uh, you're always attentive to the one that owns your ear or your mind. You're always, you always are to that. That's why when trauma comes, you may have an attentive ear to God, but the higher hearing actually is the trauma. As soon as it comes, it takes you away from hearing God. It takes away your ability to perceive and, and discern. Needs and desperation always shuts down discernment. It always does. Hebrews 11, first closing. Hebrews 11, 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was at the past the age, but she judged him faithful. Oh, she judged him. Oh, she judged him. Oh, he did what? She judged him. Well, how did she do that? How do you think that happened? I mean, I like, I like, you know, we, we peruse so many things in Scripture and you just, oh, I don't judge him. Okay, whatever. No, I want to know how she judged him. How'd she do that? You know what she did? <laughs> this is what I believe happened. I'll stay put. She was watching her husband. She's watching other people by watching others receiving from God by faith what was given to them by faith. That's how she judged it. You have to listen to me very carefully. You ever seen somebody get something before and you were waiting for something for a long time? I mean, like years, like decades? You pray for one person one time and they get it instantly what you've been waiting for 20-some years? Have you ever had that? Yeah. You ever had that happen? Yeah. yeah. Ding. Ding, 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 ding. Especially when you're a minister. Ding, 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 ding. I mean, you're giving out stuff and things are popping around people, which is awesome. <sighs> But see, you have to rejoice in the presentation of what God did them in a moment. Because what happens is, expectations, you have to rejoice in the expectations of what you've seen others get right away. You know why? Because God's working on your character. That's what he's doing. And when you find out the character of faith, and you're moving in it, it's just as powerful as having faith for a moment to produce something. Now, I haven't got into unlocking all this yet, but there are some things here that I'm saying that Sarah judged because she watched. She's watching her husband. Listen, you know, Abraham messed up. That dude did some squirrely stuff for a guy that's a father of faith. Man, what a jacked up. You did some stupid stuff, dude. I mean, really, you did. You did some dumb things. That's my wife. Uh, excuse me. That's my sister. There you go. I mean, what? You think, I don't think Sean would tolerate that too well. I tell you the truth. I'm just going, how, you switched on a dime. Like, well, we were just, you know, and then, and then yeah, what? Yep. 
you're out of here. You know why he did that? Because he's an S. In a personality profile and a disprofile, he's an S. S uses their heart. They don't like confrontation. You know what he's avoiding? Trauma. That's what he's avoiding. I don't want the confrontation, so I don't want the trauma. Just take my wife. Oh, my sister. Okay, this guy did some bonehead, some, I mean, he did some bonehead stuff. A couple of years down the street. I'm a little tired. Here comes the D. She's strong. This woman is strong. He's the one that was told by God, you know, through you, I'm gonna, we're going to have a baby, right? <laughs> Until your wife speaks. Here, take my handmaiden. Go make a baby. You know what he's avoiding? Trauma and drama. I want confrontation. Obviously, a birth in Ishmael. Again. But she knew, you know, as this thing began to play out, I don't have time to unlock all the things that happened there, but there's some powerful things to understand how quickly we can switch in a moment when something of a government official wants your wife. Listen to the lingo. The government official wants the wife of Jesus. That's powerful. If I'm the bride of Christ, that makes me the wife to Christ. Do you think the government's after me? Yes. You bet it is. Make you think, doesn't it? Yes. Now, there's all kinds of stuff that's going in behind that, but the reality is there's some stuff. See, if, you, if you're not settled in your heart, the trauma will just blind you and say, no, I, I'll do any. Oh, yeah, I'm your girlfriend. What, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. <laughs> what I love about what I'm putting out here, and I'm kind of, I'm not going to get through the last 27 pages here, but that's okay. I'm giving something in this atmosphere because I, I have to have your mind set on God. I have to have your mind. Listen, I'm not going to put blame on what, how people responded the first time that this thing came around and the glory of death because the glory of death came first. It came around the world. That's what COVID was. It's the glory of death. That's what it was. That tells me the glory of God's near because the trauma of the fake glory wants you to cast your eyes on that so you don't see the eyes to see and usher in the real glory of God. Got that? Okay. The next time this happens, which I believe is going to happen, and this is going to be the, actually one of the few places I feel that God can actually root and grow, <clears throat> that when glory begins to come, it doesn't matter what's in the atmosphere and what the government's telling you to do. The government wanted to shut down the churches of God. There's a few, like Cheon and some people that said, no, we're not going to let you do that. Because he understands. He actually understood it. But I'm telling you, when something comes that is opposing the glory of God, and the house of God is the glory of God, there'll be so many people standing in line to get into this place, no matter what the government is saying, because the abiding force of who he is and what he is You'll stay here. There will not be an empty chair. It'll be all full. There'll be standing room only and lines to get in. But you've got to get back. I thought it was great to watch what people did because it proved where they were in this Christian culture. How quickly they ran when the government said no. Listen. Oh, boy, I, just felt, I felt something shoot through me. I've got to be careful here. <laughs> Who's the king that started the fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Who? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, oh yeah. So, so, so what happened here? He made an idol of himself. And he said, hey, you boys need to bow when this music starts playing. You need to bend your knee, boy. If you don't, I'm frying you. Okay, what's going on? Trauma. See, trying to close their eyes. But these guys are 
they're rascals for God. They go, no, dude, I don't think so. Now, if you read the scripture, it says, hey, O King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? If you read that right, if you want to see the lingo of it, he's doing this. They're going, you know, we used to say, O Majesty, and just King, because there's only one king. But he calls him King Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> like, it's like slang for, hey, dude, we're going to street talk now. And um, nope, you're not king to us. Yeah. I'm not going to say, oh, majesty, what do you have to say to me? Hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, if I get thrown in this fire, God's able. But if he doesn't, huh. Okay, most people think, oh, they don't have faith to sustain it. But that's the character of faith saying, if I go in this fire and I perish, God's going to get me back in another way. It doesn't matter what you say. See, character of faith is a different thing because they're saying, well, if we have faith if he takes us or he doesn't, the character of faith is going to respond to your idiot thing that you're saying right now because we're not going to bow to your governance. That's what, we're, that's what I'm saying. So see, the trauma was there because death was present to consume the child of God. And they knew in character of faith, they've been around Daniel, they know what's going on, they've seen enough things, they have a conviction. It's not an attempt, it's a conviction. You have to see unseen things in order to have a conviction. A conviction. You have to be in a place that demonstrates the power of God, the healing power of God, the deliverance of God. That's what builds conviction. And once you have that established, you can go to anybody and say, listen, you think I'm going to bow before that because I understand trauma. You're trying to get my eyes to close to, to something that God wants to do because you think you're God. You think your governance is greater than my God? You really believe that? I don't care. If I go in there and I don't perish, cool. But if I do, cool. Because the character of faith says he's going to respond to me even if I turn to dust and he pulls me back. That's on him. That's not you. See, the character of faith has to be established in the unseen realm. You have to commit to that. You have to commit when it doesn't happen the way you thought it would. You need to commit. That's the problem with the body of Christ. They don't commit. you got to commit. Commit. You bury your kids, you commit. That has nothing to do with what happened to you. What's he going to do to respond to that? Because the character of faith says he's going to respond. If God tells Abraham, I'm going to take you in, and you're going to have a child, and you've got to wait 20-some-odd so, so years, he committed. He did stupid stuff. He had hidden doubts. He had honest doubts. Man, if I don't give my wife as my sister, I'm going to get fried. He had honest doubt. Even though he had God show up, he's still working it out. It's okay to have honest doubt as long as you commit. If you're going to fall, fall forward. Well, I don't know if I like that. Does this make sense? You can't just be wandering around. I'm going to try this for a while. Oh, that offended me. I'm going to go over here. Oh, I don't like that person. Uh, like all the sound effects? That's great. See, you've got to know how to commit. I mean, would you build a boat for how many years? Yeah, just... This is 60 years I've been doing this. This is 78 years I've been doing this. That's somebody that's committed. That's not an attempt. That's a, that's, I have a conviction about it. The fact that if you wander around tells me you don't have a full conviction of what you're supposed to become. <laughs> just telling it like it is. I'd rather have somebody tell me the truth than just give you a good Christian scripture and say, oh, it's okay, brother. No, it's not okay. It's not okay. I'm not going to make up another gospel and to make you feel good. I'd rather offend you with truth and get you squared away than me just water down the gospel and make me an idiot and you just happy because I'm dumb. <laughs> Barry, you're not a pastor. I know that. I know that. I know that. I know that. What am I doing? 
Why am I saying this? I'm giving you a language for a day that's coming. That's what I'm doing. I'm giving you a day that I see is coming. I'm giving you the language, commit. Commit to the presence of God. Commit to a company of people. Commit. Like Noah committed to the ark, or to build the ark. Like Abraham committed to this promise. You need to commit. You need to commit. And listen, if you're doubting it, it's okay. All it's doing is revealing the honest doubt that's present. Take it to him, man. He knows what to do with it. Most people don't want to be raw and real with God because it violates the culture of that you're in to say, oh, if I say that, they don't think I'm much a man of faith or a woman of faith or however you want to put it. But I realize there's a lot of people that have hidden behind Scripture and they have run around with closed Scripture because they can quote it, but they don't get the evidence of it because they have honest doubt. Then you go, well, it says, you know, there's no, you don't doubt in your heart. Well, wait a minute. If there's, it's there, God will take it out. What's the big deal? Don't beat yourself up over that. You guys okay? Yeah, exactly. Man, I've had some conversations with God. I'm going to close on this. It's, kind of, it's a little heavy, but I'm going to close on it, okay? Because I'm real. I'm just real. I shared this last night, and I'm going to share it here. But when Sean and I walked through the trial with my son and um, went through the whole process of his health issues and then him passing on my birthday at three years old. And, uh, man, I fought, and we fought hard. Hard. Okay. I'm a perfect candidate for honest doubt. Perfect. Perfect. I mean, we had some people praying. Kim was with us. I mean, Kim Clement. I mean, we had some Bob was with us. I mean, we had some, we had some heavy-duty hitters. And um, he passes in um, 8.20 in the morning on my birthday. And I go over to the bed, and my wife and I both go on there, and I, I put my hand on him. I turn to my wife, and I said, this isn't over. This isn't over. She's watching. She knows. Third day comes around. I had taken him out of the funeral home and I brought him over to my in-law's house. I want my son back. I want him back. Scripture says. Resurrection is an easy thing. That's elementary. Very, very elementary. Okay? Take him home to my in-law's house. And uh, the fourth day comes. Now listen to me very carefully. This is just me, okay? It's called honest doubt. This is, I'm giving you an example because I'm just going to be raw and real with you. Fourth day comes around and I say this to God. How can you relate to me when you yourself couldn't even be away from your own son for three days? Day four. You're going to minister to me on day five? How can you relate to me? How can you do that? I'm thinking, see, that's honest doubt. That's honest. It's like, I want to know. It's not like I'm challenging him, but I just want to know, how does that work? I want to know. Would you like to know what he said to me? I have one begotten son, but I have many sons. You are his son. Okay? He goes, there's people that I'm not going to get back, Barry. Now, he's not easing my tension between the promise of what I'm after. He's getting rid of my doubt that's honest and saying, I still want to talk with you. You're, you're on the right path, but let's remove the honest doubt. And that's what he did. And then it began to progress me in the character of faith. Just because I didn't get it in the moment doesn't mean he's not going to respond to it. Ooh, I'm saying some stuff. God does not have a clock in heaven. He's not playing by a clock. He's playing by the spirit of himself. And when he sees himself in you, he's all over that. And he will stay with you until you are the fullness of him. Even if you've been through trauma, he'll come up and say, 
What things? What's going on with you? Why are you so sad? You guys okay? Yes. Commit. Commit. And don't commit because you got a problem. Commit because you have the invitation to become as he is. You mean I actually have, I'm actually the counterpart to God. Did you know that? You guys are counterparts to God. Did you know that? You're actually a counterpart to God. He's up there. You're the counterpart of him down here. If God decided to live here, he looks just like you and me. You guys all right? You guys get anything out of that yet? At least you answered right, because if you said no, i keep going. <clears throat> Let's all stand for a minute here. Yeah, there's so much in uh, there's just so much in this atmosphere right now. Did anybody get challenged in that at all? Is there a challenge in it? Did anybody receive fresh revelation? You got some insights today. Okay. Let me be back here in a little over two weeks. Oh, I got two, two woos, a clap. I'm up to four. Now, I'm all for healings, deliverance, all of that. And you have access to all of that. Dr. Bob is masterful at it. Like I said, you have a national treasure in this house, and you don't even recognize it sometimes because you're too close and you've been around him for so long. You're like, I don't know, he's just Bob. No. A lot of people do not understand the things that he and I and people in the ministry have sown to get where we're at, and we put everything into it. I laid my life down for it. It's almost, if you're not careful, you can be offended because people don't respect it. If it doesn't meet their belief system, I'm offended. But I got news for you. Anything that's freely given is freely rejected. That's why when the offering is asked for, if the ground is good, wisdom says, give in to that. So when Bob takes an offering, it's not because he needs it. It's you do. (laughs) The seed pulls from the soil. People, that's why the high drama, when you see a kid starving, lots of money. Because you're easily swayed by emotion. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying pay attention. But when a man of God comes and produces something as powerful as what he's carrying, you need to respect that and you need to build on that. I'm not trying to give a giving message. I'm trying to give the value of you to build your house right. And I believe there's people that will understand that in days ahead because they're going to hit the wall and some of the trauma's coming. They're going, I know where the strength's at. I will return to that house. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people got offended by the years that I preached. They left, but as soon as they hit trauma, they came back to me because they knew where strength was at. Yeah. And it usually takes a contradiction to reveal the core of what the person's really at because they have doubt, honest doubt, and trauma in their lives. But they'll recognize strength, but they won't give into it because they still have their own kingdom they're trying to build, their own belief system. All right. Am I on here? Okay. I should be on here. Father, I call upon you and I call upon the spirit of wisdom. In the days ahead, there's a language that's being created for a day that has not yet arrived. 
days of Noah and the great men of old had a language for a day that was yet to come, yet the people amongst them did not know the language. It's asked that the spirit of wisdom would give understanding to those that are seeing and what's being heard this day. It shall be developed to the fullness of the fruit of what it's intended to become. For the riches shall be tied to the glory, as it is clear in your scripture, God, that the fullness of what's going to happen, that the wealth of what's in the kingdom shall be made manifest also in those that stand in the value of righteousness and understanding of you being the author of faith, you being the one that's the one that's the finisher of our faith. That there'll be continually in a, a pressing in to have evidence of the unseen. And that we continually move towards this birthright in the fullness of what the glory looks like upon a company of people called your wife. This government is not going to touch this bride. But we shall establish ourselves in such a powerful way that the government will come to you, this place, and say, you truly are the wife of the Most High God. Father, I thank you for the privilege it is to release who you are to this company of people that understand the value of what you're trying to establish in this earth. For we will not be a needy people amongst you, but we will have a company of people that are with great abundance because that's all you can teach. That's all you can teach. I thank you, Father. Bless this house. Let the fullness of what has been said move their mind to the fullness of yours, that they have the same mind, the same heart, any honest doubt that's in this house. Let them come before you, touched with love, raised up in righteousness, sitting, sitting on a throne, established the authority, Thank you for the privilege to become the fullness of who you are. Everybody agrees with that, says amen. 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 <clears throat> Go ahead and be seated for a minute. <clears throat> that was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Barry, I just had my hair cut a few weeks ago, and she said I have more hair than I used to have. Okay. So I'm, follow, I'm following your pattern. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not the other way around. All right. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, we're going to take up a second offering. And listen, I know you were touched by that. I know that God spoke to the depth of your heart, that you were open to it. And Part of the reason we just worshiped and praised for that whole hour and a half beforehand, it opens you up to hear, to be able to hear. And <clears throat> it's what Jesus tried to teach from the beginning. You know, when he was teaching them to pray, he said, he said, don't be as the Gentiles. He goes, they seek their needs. He goes, seek first the kingdom, seek your father. And <clears throat> he gave a whole different way of seeing things. And that's really, I believe that's what we are going to give to the world. Like Barry was saying, when that whole plague came, a lot of the churches folded and said, why? Because they didn't have the foundation. But I'm okay with that because I believe that the true bodies of Christ all around the world, not just this nation, the true bodies of Christ stood up and the true generals. And I believe that... Um, what Bob Jones prophesied, he said, when the Chiefs win the Super Bowl. And they did it four years ago, and they, uh, or they were in the Super Bowl, they won it four years ago. They were playing San Francisco. And this year, four years later, they were playing San Francisco. And they won the Super Bowl. And he said, that's when the apostolic Chiefs are going to begin to rise up. What, what is an apostle? They built a lot of churches, Bob. <laughs> No, that's not, that's not really what they are. They establish culture. 
they change culture. So they get non-tongue talking, tongue talking Christians to talk in tongues. What, what is that? In other words, those who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost but don't ever speak in tongues because they're controlled by their soul more than their spirit. They don't allow their spirit to take charge. So they don't speak in tongues very often because their soul needs significance. So Jesus, the greatest thing he gave us was the Holy Spirit. So I believe that the believers are going to start to pray. Like, can you imagine if every believer in the world prayed for one hour in the Holy Ghost, what would happen? I mean, every, every believer, of course, you know, the Baptists would have to get saved. <laughs> no, they just have to get filled with the Holy Ghost. All right. Um, <clears throat> what an amazing message. We're going to sow into that message and we're going to sow into the man. So there's a couple ways you can do that. If you're writing out a check, I think it's IAC, right? ILC. 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 International Life Center. And if you are giving through the text, um, just go down to when you scroll down, scroll down to where it says guest. You give that way. If you're giving through cash, just anything that comes in this offering is all going there. So go ahead and do that. What a tremendous opportunity to sow seed into such a revelation. And as good as today was, I'm telling you, you need to, if you haven't listened to Thursday, uh, it, will, it will seal up things that were said today. I want you to stretch your hands out toward Barry. Just say this, I bless you, Barry. I bless you, Barry. Grace, grace to you, Barry. Grace, grace to you, Barry. Grace to your family. Grace. To your, to your household, to all that you do, all that you do. I, sow I sow of my life, of my, life. Of my, labor. Of my labor, I sow it into you, I sow it into the message that God sent through you today, amen, amen, ushers, you can go ahead and receive the offering. Oh, did you guys learn something today? Yeah. I think so. Right, we love you guys and we appreciate you. you know, those of you that are watching, thank you for staying until the end. And I pray that this week that God's grace will be with you and I pray that his kingdom, his righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit will be with you. Have an amazing week and we will see you here again next Thursday. God bless you. You're dismissed.